Thank you. So um, as I was saying, this is a part of a series of uh, partnerships that we have done with the uh, with First Children's Finance and the Vermont Small Business Development Center. Um, and this this one tonight is dedicated to um, some legal considerations for your child care business. We have a team of presenters tonight, uh, starting with Aaron Roche from the uh, First Children's Finance, and then um, Jean Ix from the Vermont Law School will introduce a panel from the law school. Um, we do have a PowerPoint, a couple things. If you keep um, muted, that will be great. And we'd love to have you on camera if comfortable, but we do have a PowerPoint. So if you feel like you need to go off camera and have supper, that's fine as well. So um, without wasting any time, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Aaron. And Aaron, should I start the PowerPoint now? That that would be great, Luann. Thanks. Um, so greetings, everyone from sunny Phoenix, Arizona, which apparently isn't that much different than sunny Vermont, but um, but here I am anyway. Uh, I am Erin Roach. I am the Vermont Director of First Children's Finance. Uh, we started our Vermont office in early 2023. Uh, February to be exact. Um, and uh, we are the business and technical assistance program for child care businesses in the state of Vermont. And so we have been working with Let's Grow Kids, working with the Vermont Small Business Development Center, and now I'm really excited to be working with the Vermont Law School um, to make this, uh, this session available to all of you. And it feels really timely. I know um, we've gotten so many questions about Act 76, um, particularly around taxes, around legalities, um, just big questions. So I'm really excited to have this opportunity. Uh, Luann, could you advance the slides? Uh, so this is what, this is what, uh, the law school team is going to cover for the most part. I'm going to talk a little about Act 76 um, just to give us some context of what we're all here for. Um, and then I'll turn it over to the legal experts in the virtual room. So just a summary of Act 76, because I'm pretty sure Vermont child care businesses are getting a little tired of hearing me start every conversation with, OK, so Act 76. Um, but here's, so since I am at this national conference in Phoenix, Arizona today, I will tell you, I just came from a session, a keynote presentation where um, they were talking about um, the challenges of childcare businesses and um, the need for higher compensation, higher wages for um, the workforce and, and some of the other challenges. And what they said was, we can solve this, what we need are two things. We need to increase the number of families that are and children that are eligible for financial assistance from the state. And we need to, at the same time, we need to increase the reimbursement rates paid to childcare businesses. And that's how we solve the problem. That is, I wrote it down because it was such, um, such a um, sort of serendipitous comment. Um, so in short, Act 76 does two big things. It increases eligibility for um, low-income families. It expands that eligibility from 350% of poverty, which is what it is right now. Um, starting in April, uh, families up to 400% of poverty. And then next October, so this time next year, families um, earning up to 575% of the federal poverty level will be eligible for state financial assistance in Vermont. That is a huge leap forward um, on, on the side of making childcare affordable for families. So that's one big thing it does. And also as, this, um, as one of these bullets says, uh, people regardless of their citizenship status will also be eligible. Um, so that all happens next year. Um, and that is really exciting. And we hope that, that this is just the first, um, first step towards sort of universal access for families, universal affordability. So the second thing it does, and it's really important that it does both of these things at the same time, is that it increases the um, 
the reimbursements that the state pays to childcare businesses. That's important because if they just made it more affordable for families, it would make it would just increase demand for childcare, and we don't have enough already. So, um, as of July second, twenty twenty three, reimbursement rates increased. Um, and then January 1st or whatever effective date that actually is, um, they'll go up again by 35%. And then again, for family child care homes, they go up again next July. So that's sort of three big increases over the course of a year. And then um, the other thing that's noted here is that, um, and I'm, I would think everyone here on this call knows this as well as I do, is um, the readiness payments. $20 million was allocated by the state for readiness payments to help childcare programs get ready for this massive expansion of um, this massive public investment into our childcare system. So those payments, I am told, they started hitting bank accounts last week. Um, so that is really exciting and that'll continue through February. Um, so hopefully it feels uh, it feels like the holidays are around your, around your place right now. Um, and so that is all the really great news about Act 76, right? It's increasing reimbursements to childcare programs at the same time it's increasing family eligibility. Uh, it also does some things that, um, that are a little bit more stressful for childcare businesses. I'm not gonna not gonna sugarcoat it. Um, and Luann, if you wanna kind of just flip through the to slide six, that would be great. Um, I just want to make sure I say them so that people don't um, don't accuse me of glossing over the hard stuff. Um, so it Act 76 also eliminates some fees that you can charge, um, or you have to reimburse them to families once they enroll. Um, it sets a rate cap that is based on inflation. That is an annual uh, rate increase. So it is capped currently this year. It is capped at 7.2%. Um, and you have to post your fee, uh, yes, post your fees publicly. Uh, just FYI, um, Let's Grow Kids, a few years ago, uh, invested in a platform called Vermont Child Care Links. Um, that is a place where you can post uh, openings in your program. You can um, make public things like your, your rates. And so um, we think it's a great place for Children's Finance, Let's Grow Kids. We think it's a great place to um, share your, um, your child care business sort of with the world and with potential um, families. And it could, if you use that, it could help you comply um, with the new law. I feel like there was something else I was supposed to mention, but um, I think I will stop there. We'll make sure to put the link to Ver uh, Vermont Child Care links in the chat um, okay. so that yeah. folks who aren't familiar with it can check it out and, and um, uh, look into it. Yep. If we could go go back one slide, Luann. And Majabine, if you would be willing to, this is this is some of the text directly from the law. And if you would if you would address this, Majabine, and sort of go through the goals of Act 76 real quick, because I think it will it will help us to sort of pinpoint the reasons we're talking about the legal situations we're discussing. Sure. Um, so the first thing that um, Aaron went over was, you know, we do want to expand the families that are eligible for Act 76. And we and the way that typically you do that is by increasing payments to the child care providers. And this kind of elevates the child care provider space by uh, by making ready, readiness payments. They may be used for the following. And one of those is to actually pay child care providers more. Um, and these are all the A through A through H lists all the ways that um, the readiness payments can be used by the child care facility to make um, the section 6A2 of the act uh, come to life and those goals and purposes actually um, be achieved. Um, so 
Um, do, I don't know if you want me to just go ahead and expand. Yeah, go ahead and just go ahead and list them off real quick. Okay. I think it's I think it's worth creating a good foundation for the legal discussion that we're moving forward with. Sure thing. Um, so the readiness payments can be used for increasing capacity for infants and toddlers. So you want to have enough room for them. And then you want to expand the number of family, ch fa family child care homes and make it sustainable for them um, going forward. And then also to improve child care facilities, like for instance, if there's lead paint in your facility, you can use the child, the readiness payments to um, get rid of that lead paint and improve your facility. And um, so things like that. And then you can also, uh, you know, um, expand the hours of operation. So if you end at five, you can actually um, ex expand your hours um, by paying other child care um, workers in your, in your business. And, um, you know, and then pretty much increasing the workforce capacity you want, we are trying to increase the number of child care providers in the state to, to kind of fill in the gaps for the lack of child care providers in the area and make home care providers, um, make it easier for them to comply and kind of bring up the, the standards and elevate child care in general. Thank you, Majabeen. Um, there's a question in the chat and Aaron and Majabeen, I think you can probably one or both of you sort of reply to that. We are going to, are we going to be needing to keep receipts or put together a budget for how we are individually using the readiness payments we receive? And this is from someone with a registered FCCH. Erin, do you want to take that or do you want me to take it? So um, there is, um, let's see, I I would say uh, there is no requirement to submit receipts um, for the readiness payments. It might be smart to keep your receipts <laughs> just like as your own business person. I, I feel like I'm treading into um into uh, into technical assistance or advice, um, but there is no um, there is no requirement um, by the state for uh, re uh, providing those receipts. Majabin, we spoke several times of the fact that these are goals of the statute. Can you go a little further into what that means for the providers? So we want to increase the quality of child care and we want to make it easier for child care providers to be able to offer a quality one of one of the terms that's used in the act is you know qualify um each child care provider with a curriculum of some sort but it doesn't really specify exactly what that um will exactly look like so a lot of uh, leeway is left over left up to the child care provider business so that's um, that's one of the goals, but um, there's a lot of discretion left to the child care provider. So so basically the act has a lot of great goals and it has some wonderful vision, but it doesn't mandate specific compliance requirements regarding keeping receipts or meeting any specific goal or how to meet those goals. Is that fair, Majabin? Yes, that's correct. Excellent. Luann, would you do two, two forwards there? Perfect. Majabine, I think this one's yours. Sure. Um, so what we're here for is, you know, the top child care legal issues that I'm sure all of you are really interested in are entity formation, which is just a uh, a fancy way of saying the type of business and what we're going to call it. Um, operating agreements, you want to put things in writing and what those are, we're going to go over that. Funding, how you're going to fund your business. Contracts, agreements with the parents um, of your the children that you're watching and taking care of. Um, labor, HR also has a lot of legal implications and all of those issues that are specific to you and that can be customized for you, depending on um, what your personal circumstances are. And basically protect su success and setting you up for success and protecting your dream um, and making sure that you achieve success in your child care provider business. Um, 
Thank you, Majabeen. One of the one of the issues, you know, when you ask the receipt question, um, we'll be we'll be lawyers here for just a second and say always document what you do anytime you can. It's always good to keep good records and to keep clean records that are separate from your personal finances. You want to go next, Luann? Column, I think you're up next. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you. Um, and I just want to say quickly, thank you for the work you do. And uh, I'm excited that you're uh, that you're getting a lot of support. So this is awesome. Um, so tonight I'm going to be talking about uh, business entities. Um, to what uh, Majibin was talking about in terms of protection, um, you picking the right business entity can can help you uh, get a lot of protection for you and, and your business. Um, so what is a business entity? Uh, it's a, a legal structure for your business. Um, I'm sure you've seen at the end of like business names, we'll have like an LLC or an Inc or a co. Um, those are all just little signifiers for what kind of business they are uh, and what kind of entity they are. Um, so when you're picking and thinking about what entity to choose, uh, these are some of the uh, uh, things to consider. Uh, how many people are involved? Is it just you? Uh, do you have a partner who you work with? Do you have a group of people who uh, want to run this business, the child care business together? Uh, how are you going to control it? Uh, is there a leader? Is, do you want consensus to be made uh, about all your decisions? Uh, do you want to have a, a for-profit uh, business or do you want to have a nonprofit? Uh, here we, we have social enterprise, but um, we'll, we'll go into more of it later. And uh, how, you, how do you want to be taxed? How do you want to interact with taxes? And of course, funding. Uh, certain entities open you up to different uh, funding uh, avenues. Uh, so I think that's it for the slide. Can I have the next one, Luen? Thank you. Uh, so these are the different kinds of business entities that uh, we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, the sole proprietor, um, we'll go into detail with each, don't worry. Um, uh, sole proprietor, which is, you know, it's just you. Uh, partnership, uh, you and maybe a couple other people. And limited liability company, which is a more formal uh, business structure. Uh, and you can have different management uh, control of it. And then the nonprofit which is the most complicated one we'll, we'll talk about today. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, next, oh, perfect, wow. You, you have a sixth sense for uh, what I'm thinking. <laughs> and speaking of sixth senses, I'd, li I'd like to talk to you about uh, just, these are uh, a key for the little symbols you'll see in the next couple of slides. Uh, the red lightning bolt for lawyer recommended, yellow for accountant, and DBA, which uh, stands for doing business as. Um, so when you see these, your, your spidey senses should go off. Um, and I'll also obviously note them too. Next slide, please, Luann. So the first one uh, I'd like to talk about is sole proprietorship. Uh, so this is a legal uh, business structure that you'll just obtain just by doing business. If I was to go out to the road right now and start selling lemonade, I would be a sole proprietor of that business. Um, and uh, so you can set it up in an instant. You can be a little bit more formal about it. Um, and by like registering uh, with the state, which is the ideal, <laughs> registering your business with the state, um, registering a, a DBA, what I just mentioned before, doing business as, um, and your funding uh, is, is just coming from yourself. So if you take out a business loan, it'll just be you signing it and you personally will be liable. So those creditors, uh, your, the bank, whoever you're taking money out, uh, taking money from, or borrowing money from, I should say, uh, you're responsible to them personally. They can reach they can reach your assets to recover that payment. Uh, taxes you'll be taxed directly. Um, so any income from the business will be considered your personal income. So you'll when you file your returns, you'll be fi filing the returns for uh, for the business as well. And there's no real legal or financial protections that you get from a sole proprietorship because you're effectively it's it's just you there. Um, so that's, that's what I want to say for this slide. Thank you, Luann. Uh, the next one is a partnership. That's when you bring someone else to the party. Uh, so if I was to invite my neighbor to start selling lemonade with me, we'd instantly have started a partnership. Um, in the same way, it, that's, that's the business structure. Uh, you can be a little bit more formal about it. You can register with the state. You can draw up a, a partnership agreement, uh, which, is, which is great too. So you can think, so you can formalize how the partnership is gonna be formed, who's bringing what. Uh, so a lot of times different people are bringing different aspect, assets to a, to a partnership. Some people are bringing uh, financial uh, funding 
some people are bringing just like what's called sweat labor or sweat sweat what is it called sweat um, equity sweat equity thank you <laughs> sweat labor is is redundant uh sweat e equity so they're just bringing their labor um and they're going to formalize that they'll say i'm going to work 40 hours a week on this project and this other person is going to bring 50k to start the business uh and then in the partnership agreement you can denote who's going to get paid out based on what they're bringing in so maybe the person who's bringing the money is going to get 70% of the funds and this other person who's just using sweat equity will be getting 30%. Uh, and then, so that's, that's basically funding. Again, you can take out loans. However, you're each going to be held liable for those, uh, for those loans you're taking out. Um, and any, and any other assets you personally have, such as a car or other property can also be reached if someone were to sue your company. Right. Thank you. And taxes in the same way as the sole proprietorship, uh, you're taxed directly um, to the proportion that you're getting. So if you remember the person who was bringing the money got 70% of the returns, they're going to have to be paying 70% of whatever that business income is uh, on their personal tax uh, returns or tax filings rather. Uh, legal financial protections, uh, not, not much. Um, on this one as well, what we were just talking about, what what um, Professor Ikes just said, um, as well in terms of your assets still being uh, reachable by those by those banks or whoever you're obtaining those loans from. If, unless you had something else to add, okay, perfect. <laughs> so here we have the little lightning bolts, um, but we'll get to those. Now, a limited liability company is uh, is a formal business uh, structure, legal business structure. What it does is it separates your assets from the companies. So now it's like a whole separate entity. So whatever you put in is all it has. And uh, so you set it up um, by registering with the state, uh, by writing up articles of incorporate or articles of organization, um, and of course, an operating agreement, which is similar to the partnership um, papers, but it um, it's a filing or a document that outlines how people are going to enter the LLC, the company, uh, how the money is going to move through the company, uh, certain policies about how you operate, um, and the funding. So this is this is the good part. So where the limited life uh, LLC is, is really handy is um, when you take out loans, you can take out loans through the company. So all when, uh, if the bank goes to collect, on, on that debt, they can only access the assets of the LLC, not your personal assets because they're separate. So that's a really key okay. thing of when you're operating an LLC is to keep everything very clear cut and very separate. All the finances are done here and then you get paid out as an employee um, or a member. Uh, what were we gonna say, Professor Reich? Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, okay, cool. Um, and so that comes into play too with the taxes. So you can elect, um, or the, the business owner, uh, however, member, however many members are in the LLC, uh, can elect to have pass-through taxation. So it, again, works the same as the sole proprietorship or the partner, partnership where it's personal income and any business income is personal income and you uh, pay taxes on it. Um, or you can set yourself up for uh, corporate tax where the LLC has its, per its own income and pays its own taxes. And that really helps maintain that separation that's key for gaining the protection that an LLC can offer. Uh, and so speaking of pr protections, like I kind of mentioned before, um, it protects you from the debts of the business. So you can borrow through the business uh, to, to gain funding, but those those uh, creditors can never access your stuff. Uh, unless, and you know, yep, go ahead. And to add to that, there's there's an option here, right? Johnny breaks his arm while he's at your daycare, you know, Johnny's parents could sue you. And the limited liability company will insulate your personal finances from that lawsuit and your home and your car and, and those sorts of things, as long as you didn't pledge them for a loan, are going to be secured from that kind of lawsuit. And that's what a limited liability company brings you. It brings you, as long as there was no criminal act, in which case everybody is responsible for their own behavior if it's a criminal act. But as 
as long as as long as it's just a civil suit, you can be insulated from those kinds of civil suits, and they can't they can't reach past the barrier that's established by the limited liability company, assuming you're filing like a corporation and acting like an entity. And um, and a further caveat on that is as 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 long as the business owner themselves aren't the person who did the uh, the act that caused harm, as well. Um, and yes, so I think that's much it for this slide. Let's right? hit insurance before we leave. Oh, here. right. Oh, sorry. The little bar is, is covering it down below. <laughs> yes. And so to that point, uh, it's also really important to have business insurance to cover what the LLC won't protect. So uh, say it was the business owner who, uh, this will obviously never happen, uh, but who uh, uh, pushed someone and they got hurt. Uh, so the insurance will help protect in that case rather than because the LLC won't uh, because it was the business owner themselves uh, who was personally responsible for the harm. And insurance is sometimes just a good thing to have so that you do not, as as the business owner, have to fight the court battle. The insurance company will pick it up and fight it for you. So insurance first and then the limited liability company second for your for your sort of order of securing your personal assets and keeping them out of your business and making sure that that there is money to settle any kind of disagreement totally and just again so uh just really quick uh the the red marker is just to say like uh it's it's really great to talk to an attorney about setting up your uh operating agreement uh, registering your business, how, like talking about how to keep those finances separate and talking the yellow lightning bolt, uh, again, being for talking to an accountant about uh, how to choose what's what's the ideal uh, form of, of taxation, taxation rather uh, either pass through or, or as a corporate tax. Um, so that's that's it for this slide. Thank you. Thank you, Luann. <laughs> cool. And uh, the last one is uh, nonprofit. Uh, so counter to its name, you can still make money uh, while operating a nonprofit, uh, you still get paid. Uh, so what is it? It's an organization, uh, a, a, again, another legal structure for a, for a company um, that has a mission, has a, is mission driven, and it doesn't, uh, it doesn't accrue profit. The profit doesn't go to the owners, or the members, it gets like reinvested into the company. Um, you set it up, it's, it's very complex. So this is definitely uh, the, the red lightning bolt is, is aptly put. Uh, because you, there's a lot of filing requirements uh, and a lot of uh, reporting requirements. Uh, and so talking to an attorney is, is great. But the, the biggest um, boon of, of running a nonprofit is that you get access to a lot more funding. Uh, there's a lot more grant uh, options, and you can also get donations. Uh, and uh, one of the other great boons is that uh, you're, you can be tax exempt. Uh, so... So that's great, and it's similar similar protections um, uh, as uh, as an LLC. Is there anything else you want to say, Professor Ike? So I I think I think most folks are saying, wait, you mean I can get paid, and I don't have to pay taxes, and I can I can have donations and grants, and the answer is yes. What do I give up then? Control. The control goes to the board. So you have a separate board of trustees when you run a nonprofit and that board of trustees makes business decisions. And if, as a director or an employee of a nonprofit, you have to go along with it. So what you're, what you're seeding is control. All right. And that is something that a lot of business owners do not want to do. However, if you were in a neighborhood and it was a childcare desert, the neighbors might want to get together, create a nonprofit organization, and and provide childcare through that nonprofit organization. So there are some some ways in which it could be a useful tool. I just want to um, jump in and say this is so such helpful information, and um, seeing the uh, names of the folks that are on this call this evening, we have a mix of individually owned family childcare, for profit leaders, and um, nonprofit programs, uh, child care businesses. So we've got a mix of programs that all fit into various um, ones of these that you described, Callum. So thank you. This is helpful. That's great. Yeah, thank you.
think that's it for me. Next slide, please. <laughs> oh, wait, just kidding. Uh, so uh, this is just a, a awesome graph um, that lets you compare uh, the different structures. Um, the only new thing that we haven't quite talked about here um, is the column to the far right, uh, which outlines the, the level of government requirements. Uh, so how much reporting you're going to have to do, how much interaction you'll have to do with the state and, and with, the, with the federal government in, in relation to taxes and income and whatnot. So, in reporting. and filings. What was that? There's reporting requirements for limited liability companies and for nonprofits. Right. So that's just so you'll have, uh, you'll go in knowing to be, to be uh, cautious. <laughs> Cool. There's also there's also more governance involved. In a sole hmm. proprietorship or a partnership, you make your decisions. When you start to get into a limited liability company, you have to have minutes, you have to call meetings, you have to get approval for major things, spending perhaps, depending on what it says in your operating agreement. So there's more red tape. There's more there's um, more to document and more more rules to follow. Um, and so when we say lever, level of government requirements, that's what we're talking about. Sometimes yeah. those internal rules are not even going to be exposed to the public, but you still have to go through the motions because that's what creates the liability barrier and that's what insulates you from those lawsuits. So it's important if you do become a limited liability company or a nonprofit that you follow all of the necessary rules so that you can ensure that liability protection. Thank Next you. slide, Luann. I think we're going to, at this point, switch over to Jasmine as well. Yes, thank you so much for that, Callum. Um, so I'm gonna discuss benefits cliff. So what is a benefits cliff? It is the sudden and often unexpected decrease and public benefits that occur with an increase in earnings, right? So why is this important? It's important because depending on your tax entity, whether you're an LLC or a corporation, Act 76 subsidies can affect these entities' taxes differently. If you feel that you may be adversely impacted by these, I recommend that you definitely speak with an accountant. And I've also dropped in a link, it's benefitscliff.org, where you can go on and actually find information about the benefit cliff. It has different benefits per states. So unfortunately, Vermont is not on there, but there are various other states that show what type of benefits the state offers to individuals and how that may impact them if their income increases. Um, also, if you feel like you're going to be in jeopardy of any of these things, for instance, say you're getting health care um, through the state of Vermont, or you yourself are actually receiving your own child care subsidy for your child. Again, this is something that I would definitely say as a business owner to please speak with an accountant about. Next slide, please. So what does this mean for your business? So uh, my colleague Callum spoke about taxes briefly. I'm going to expand on some of these parts that he talked about a little bit more in depth. So a sole proprietorship, as he even discussed, it is one member and the all, all of the business losses and profits are passed through to the owner's personal income tax. So at the end of the year, the business owner themselves is filing all of the business losses and the profits on their own personal income tax. An LLC, there's a couple different ways that you can structure the taxes within an LLC. Um, by default, an LLC can be taxed as a disregarded entity. This means that you are a single member, essentially just like a sole proprietorship. It's just you. You are taxed. Again, all the business losses and profits are going to be passed through to you, and you're going to file all of those on your personal income taxes. Next is a partnership. A partnership is one or more people. However, the income tax is not paid by the business. The profits and the losses are going to be reported on the partner's tax returns, and any tax that is due will be paid at the individual level. Also, partners cannot be employees of their business, which is a separation between the next one. I'll expand on that a little bit. However, partners can have employees, but themselves cannot be considered an employee of their partnership. An S-Corp. 
An S Corp is a sub chapter S. There is an IRS form. Um, someone who has an LLC can fill out to be taxed as an S Corp. There are some restrictions and requirements, however, to be taxed as an S Corp. One, the company must be formed in the United States. There can be not, there cannot be any more than a hundred owners within the LLC. All of the owners must be US residents and actual humans. I say that because you cannot be AI. You actually have to be a human being. And there can only be one class of members. So compared to a corporation, a traditional C-Corp is what we think of. Um, within a C-Corp structure, you can have uh, varying levels of memberships. But within a C-Corp, you are only allowed to have one class of members. And if you're a sole proprietorship, you're one class of member, right? Most of these- With, Within an S-Corp. Within an S-Corp, yes. Within an S-Corp, sorry. Um, Next, uh, okay. And then an owner of an entity taxes an S Corp who works for the business is considered an employee or they can choose to be considered an employee. What does that mean? That means they can draw a salary. So you're gonna draw a salary on the wages that you are paid as an employee and um, you're subject to FICA. So that means FICA is your social security and your Medicare tax. And these payments are not subject to employment tax. So again, so the wages that you are paid are going to be earned income that is going to be subject to FICA based on the salary that you are drawing from your business. And these payments that you're receiving are not subject to self-employment tax. And so the, then, benefit, the benefit okay. to this, the S Corp in this situation would be that you can hold some of your profit in the S Corp and not pay it out as your salary when you roll over to the next year. And what that means is if someone going back to the benefits cliff is close to that benefits cliff, you can adjust your salary accordingly to keep yourself from going over the benefits cliff. Hey, Jean. Yes. I think that was profound. And I wonder if you could say it one more time in case anybody had, you know, put a bite of hamburger in their mouth or something. There you go. Um, the importance of the S Corp is that you can be an employee of the S Corp as the owner and you can pull a salary and you can hold extra proceeds in the S Corp into the next year and not pay them through as income or take them as income. That means that if you're close to the benefits cliff, you can adjust your salary so you fall under the salary where benefits terminate. So you can you can keep just under where benefits would terminate with your salary. And that allows you more control, particularly with this 35% coming through to you. It's a, it's a great thing, but it may knock people off the benefits cliff. So this allows you to go to your accountant, talk to them and figure out what numbers and what salary is the best for you to keep your benefits. It's a numbers game and the accountant will help you play it. But an S Corp enables you to do that and you can only do it with an LLC. Thank you for Professor Ikes. So lastly, an LLC can file to be taxed as a C Corp. Um, within the C Corp though, there is double taxation. What does this mean? This means that the LLC itself will pay taxes on the profits made. And then there will be a second tax that the owner will then have to pay as well. So again, there's a double taxation with the C Corp. Um, and I just wanna reiterate what Professor Ike said, again, that this information is that we're giving you as a very high level overview. However, there are benefits to being an S Corp um, within the LLC, filing as an S Corp, I should say. Um, please speak with an accountant. And this, this should be taken as a kernel of an idea for you to take to your accountant. This is not the end all be all. We're not telling you it will benefit you specifically to do this. You really have to go to an accountant, take your books, take your personal income and say, what is the best way for me to proceed? And the accountant can help you decide which IRS form would work best. And then the attorney can help ensure that you get everything filed correctly and you have the right agreement in place. 
Um, I would even go so far as to recommend that you bring your attorney and your accountant together for a half hour conversation. Thank you for that. I just saw a question pop up. I didn't know if someone read it. Aaron, Aaron, why don't you unmute and bring that up because that's key. Sure. Um, I just put in the chat because uh, I you you guys are on a roll and I didn't want to interrupt. Um, that the readiness payments that um that are getting paid out right now, um, it is a totally allowable expense for you to use some or all or whatever of those readiness payments to pay an accountant to pay an attorney um, to help you look into what the best structure is for your business, what um, what changes to your um, income you might be forecasting and how that might affect your taxes. And um, anyway, all of these sorts of questions, um, that would be uh, that would be a way to pay for it if um, if you wanted to look into it. That's such a great point. Thank you, Jasmine. Next slide, please. Back one. Back one. There we go. Yeah, one more. Oh. I think it's going. Oh no. Back. Keep going back. I keep going back. I think you're going forward. One more. Oh. Huh. It's okay. But then sometimes it's helpful to start over, reset. Yeah, I'll let her get reset. Absolutely. That's right. You know, while we're while we're doing that, if anybody has questions and you wanted to shout it out or you wanted to put it in the chat, um, it's always a useful thing to do when we're struggling with technology. Wendy, you got your hand up. Hi, yes, yeah, sorry. I came on a little late. A um, few questions and kind of all over the board. How do we apply for readiness payments? Um, the state has an application. I will find it and put it in the chat in the next minute or two. Great. Um, and then just on the capped rate scale, it, it moved kind of fast, but it looked like it said it was 328 a week for preschool. Um, so I'm just wondering if that means we can't charge more than the thirteen twelve a month. Did I hear all of that right? Capped rates part. Did we did we look at that? You did, yeah. It was like okay. six and then we went back. Oh, right. That um hang on, I gotta look. I think that was looking at reimbursement reimbursement rates okay yeah um so that is the maximum that the state will reimburse for families that are eligible for financial assistance that those rates changed in july um and that's already happened so that's what the state pays in financial assistance um if you have a rate agreement with the state that is at least that much um the rate cap is says that you can only increase your tuition annually this year up to 7.2%. Okay, but it doesn't say what the amount is. It's just setting. No, it doesn't. That percentage. would be based on whatever your rates were July 2nd. It's it's a ceiling on increases. Okay. Thank Increase you. rate versus, yeah. versus the total amount. And um, I'm going to interject to say that um, you will, there will be an announcement within the next day or so around um, a session specifically on all of the pieces of Act 76, Wendy, especially what you're referring to that can help you with some of these details about, you know, what the why is and how to, how to apply for things and that sort of thing. So um, look for that to be coming soon. We're working with Child Development Division and all the partners, the usual partners to present a session on, on that. So details around that part of the law, um, more to come on that, more to Great, come on thank that. You. 
And and the the place at the state to to look for these things is the Department of Children and Families, which is the agency implementing Act seventy six. Go ahead, and Jasmine. I apologize, um, Jasmine. Is this the slide you we were supposed to be on? My computer is going all over the place, so I'm off of slideshow. But is this? Yep, this right is the slide? correct slide. This is okay. The I'm going to go to slideshow then, and hopefully we could. Make Perfect. It work. Thank you. On all that. Thank you. Okay, so mandated compliance. In order to receive the subsidy, a child care provider must either be licensed or registered and must follow the applicable compliance requirements. So this is just a basic generalization. There are obviously more requirements that are within the regulations. And on the next slide, you'll see some resources that you can refer back to, to actually see what it takes to either be licensed or um, registered or if you are already currently licensed or registered, just to go back and do a refresh. But um, obviously, yes, you need to be licensed. Also, there's legal reporting mandates. So such as like emergencies or what happens if there's you have to report some sort of abuse. Um, emergency preparedness is also something that is within the basic guidelines. What are you going to do in the event of a catastrophic event? You know, Vermont, we just had unprecedented flooding. What would happen if it started flooding in the middle of you having children in, at your home or either at your facility? Health, safety, and nutrition is also mandated compliance. There's also personal staff ratio. So depending upon which license or registration you're getting, you have certain staff and child ratios that you must comply with. Also building and home maintenance. So this was mentioned earlier, removing lead. Um, if there's lead in your building or lead in your home, some uh, licensing and registration requires water testing. Also, any updates to the premises that need to be made to make it to come into building code compliance. And then if you are a family child care provider and you're working out of your home, what is the designated child care area that you have that is separate from the other parts of your home and ensuring that you have certain parameters in place? Next slide, please. You might just have oh, to leave yeah. it on. Uh, there we go. Oh. It either won't go or it goes completely wild. In the bottom left, is there a little like arrow? Are there little arrows for you? Yeah, try the arrows on the. So if the one, go. yeah, pointing there to the left go. should should bring there you back. There you go. There you go. Oh, circumvents over. my computer and uses the PowerPoint. Thank you. Yeah, go one more slide over for me, please. Other way. Oh, so yeah. Right. Go. Yeah. There you go. You got it. Okay. Thank you. Um, as I mentioned previously, these are links that you can go to to access if you want to learn more information about compliance, uh, what is going to be required if you are already licensed and registered or you would like to become licensed and registered. Please refer back here. Thank you. Next slide. Next, next slide. Majabeen, I think you are up next. Okay, um, thank you, Jasmine, for that great information. Um, so at this point, you might be wondering or asking yourself, you know, how can a lawyer help you choose your actual business entity? Um, they can help you make informed choices. Um, and it really depends on your personal circumstance and they can go over um, what your circumstances and you can choose, you know, how much you wanna grow, um, how to transition using this act and what it requires. Um, and also what parts should have a lawyer, your structure choice. Do you want, you know, are you, are you in a solo business? Do you, would you, do you need the pass through taxation? These are things that a lawyer can all help with and especially the operating agreement and the bylaws, you know, the lawyers can write and review this and they can actually even go over financing details. They can write and review and also watch your back. And, what I mean by that is, you know, lawyers can be on your side, you know, um, and you you can ask them questions and they can keep you abreast of all the legal issues that come up. And if you read an article or something, you don't have to have anxiety about it. You can just email your lawyer and they'll have your back. Um, yeah. Um, so next slide, please. And then you might also be asking, can I do it myself? So that also depends. Um, some entities are DIY, DIY friendly and some parts are DIY friendly. Um, there's lots of resources to help. Um, even a wizard online at the Secretary, Secretary of State's office can help. You can actually do that part 
probably yourself and save, you know, those attorney hours and you can kind of work collaboratively with a lawyer. Um, but you can do that part probably yourself, but there are lots of tools out there. Some are good and some are questionable. So you, you do have to have some more knowledge uh, on what those are. And a lawyer can proofread a legal document for you. They can do some of it. They can, they don't have to do all of it. You know, if you're starting your business, you don't want to liquidate and use up all your resources right at the start. You can kind of have a limited scope engagement. And all that means is that um, you can do part of the process where you just sign on to the Secretary of State's website and you start the process yourself. And then the rest, the attorney can help you with and they can collaborate with you and you can get creative. You know, clients choose how to work with a lawyer. Don't forget that an attorney were here to help you. You are the one paying the attorney and they're actually here to work for you and work with you. Um, so it all depends on your needs and don't be afraid. And if you find, you know, um, the fees are too high, you can always do pushback and you can always, you know, negotiate. It's what you need. And attorneys are, you know, they, if they're going to work with you, they have to collaborate with you. It should be a relationship where you set the tone, you know, sorry. Vermont, for... Vermont attorneys are a small business, much like you are. And, you know, your local attorney is, is going to, to be open to working out payment plans. Your local attorneys probably, I, the running, the running joke in legal circles is some accept eggs, um, you know, in exchange for legal services services. And, and that's just, it's a very Vermont thing. So, so reach out, talk to them, ask them, you know, could I pay a little now and a little later? Um, I'd love to have an ongoing working relationship with you, but I can only afford two hours of your time right now. How can we best use that two hours? All of those kinds of conversations are conversations to have with your attorney. Um, we've talked a lot about the Limited Liability Corporation today, um, which is an LLC. Um limited liability company, pardon me, not corporation. Um, and that, that limited liability company is, um, it's a piece where you can do a big chunk of that work. As we said, this wizard at the secretary of state, it's really easy to file and become an LLC at the secretary of state in Vermont's website. Um, but when it comes to the operating agreement, you're going to want to you're going to want to think about how you want your business to work write it down and then go see an attorney who can write it up for you and who can create that legal document for you um are there other tools out there like legalzoom sure and you could use legalzoom as a starting point but you still want the lawyer to read over it and make sure that it it really does fit the laws in vermont and the regulations in vermont so that you're complying right out right from the start. Go ahead, Masha Bean. Oh, that's right. And then I think Aaron just put in the chat, which is really, really key, especially for me with my kids. It's some attorneys might want to get paid in hours of childcare. So, I mean, that's totally, um, you know, worth its weight in gold. I'll tell you that. So, and then, um, and then you might also next question, how do I find a lawyer? Um, word of mouth, you know, if you have other childcare businesses in your community and they like their lawyer, go with them. If they're pro close proximity to your house and your childcare facil facility, you should go with them. Because if you don't feel comfortable working with someone only online or Zoom, you're going to want to work with them and just drive down to their office or be like, hey, I got this in the mail or I just read this. And you want to have that relationship where a lot of Vermont attorneys, you can just kind of, you know, you don't always want to drop in, but you could, you know, if you really were anxious about something and you had a burning question. Um, you can Google websites, of course, there's not, you know, Vermont's, um, you can go online and Google um, what what law firms are near you. You can also call the Vermont Bar Association. Um, and a lot of times the initial half hour consultation um, will, you know, won't be more than $25. A lot of times the first hour might be free, um, but that just, it all depends. You just kind of have to ask around and kind of do a little bit digging. Um, but then also we have this great resource at our, our legal lab here, um, where you can, you know, we'll educate, we'll help educate you, um, in that capacity. And then you could be eligible for up to 10 hours of, um, free legal advice. Um, next, so, and I think the next slide covers a bit of that. Much of me. 
Okay, and next slide, please. And then um, if you need legal services, um, don't be afraid um, to, to check out vermontlaw.edu and you know you can click on that and then um, hopefully that will help out some folks. And then we offer at our legal lab, we offer educational consults. We are here to answer and educate you. We can't obviously give you legal advice because a lot of us students have not passed the bar and we don't wanna be getting into that territory. We're a school. Um, and then um, we do offer up to 10 hours of um, free legal uh, uh, a referral and we can find the attorney for you um, to meet your specific legal needs and pay for the first part of the services to get you going. But the education part is really key because we'll help frame the questions and make the questions that you ask really efficient. So you're not kind of, you know, using your hours um, kind of um, researching um, will kind of help frame you and guide you in that direction. And then, um, yeah, I, I think that's all. Thank you for your attention, everybody. Um, yeah, and then and here's some. So do, do folks have questions for us? Um, obviously, you know, the, the Small Business Development Center is a great resource. Um, we recommend that you go there and, and have a business plan and put it together. And then once you've got your business plan put together, come see VSEL. We'll provide legal education. We'll help you think about entity formation. The SBDC has a formal handoff to us and, and we work with them to make sure that you get what you need as far as legal education is concerned. Then when it comes time to write that operating agreement and actually do the specific work for your business, we can refer you on for up to 10 hours of legal services. Operating agreements don't take 10 hours to write, folks. So it really is, it's like getting a free operating agreement. Um, now that's for an LLC. Nonprofit, if you want to form a nonprofit, that's considerably more work and it's and it's it's going to cover a lot of your nonprofit, but it probably won't cover all of it. Um, questions? So I'm gonna jump in before the questions and and we do have time for questions. So I just wanted to stop and say, this is so much great information. It's like a um, supermarket of, of information. And we will send um, the recording of this and the PowerPoint to the folks on this call so you can refer back and have those links. Um, right now in Vermont, there are so there's such opportunity with this new law that's starting to um, be, be implemented as of, uh, as of the um, readiness payments. As of last week, um, I think over 100 pro uh, programs had already received their first readiness payment. Over 650, I think, programs had applied already. So if you have not applied for the readiness payments, the, the application is very simple. Um, go to the Child Development Division website and get the link. It's very simple, very quick, and the payments are flowing. So, um, and the support is here. So. Erin um, and her team at First Children's Finance have all kinds of business resources, as as she shared a little bit of. And I think you already put the link in the in the chat, Erin, or uh, you did, yeah. And then our connection to the Small Business Development Center and um, the law school through Jean and her students is just phenomenal. So I'm here to say the opportunity and the supports and the resources are here. Um, it's it's just a lot all at once. A lot of changes all at once and a lot is happening all at one time, but the resources and the supports are here. So I want to quickly go over before we open it up to questions, some more opportunities for um, support that are coming. We know you have a lot of questions about the law as Wendy started diving into and I'm thinking many of you have some more questions as well. There's going to be a session and Aaron, I couldn't find it really quickly. It's October 18th. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. October yes, 18th during the day, um, Child Development Division, First Children's Finance, and Vermont AYC will be um, uh, doing a session during nap time during the day. Um, it will be recorded for those who can't make it to share specific information about the law. So any of you with questions really related to that, um, um, that's an opportunity. Secondly, uh, next week on October 10th and the following week on October 17th, we're getting together with some folks from the Richards Group who focus on benefits with all this new 
um, income coming into programs. It's an opportunity to consider um, better and more increased benefits or adding benefits if you have not had them for your staff or yourself, depending on your kind of uh, programming. On October 10th, the uh, session will be for uh, child care businesses that have um, employees. And October 17th, it will be a session on benefits for um, individually run family child care programs. Uh, those uh, uh, sessions have been sent out through the Let's Grow Kids um, social media and email, so you should have links to that. The following Tuesday night, um, we are um, getting together with Teresa Mealy, who is a, an HR person, um, who also, along with Jean and her team, works with the Small Business Development Center. Um, Teresa ran a child care business before um, she had her HR consulting business, and she's coming, um, gathering with us to talk about um, um, some HR considerations with all the new money coming in and what you should consider. So these are all coming up. We're offering them. They're short, an hour, hour and a half sessions to give you all this information. It's all being recorded. So if you can't make the times they're scheduled, there will be an opportunity for you to view them on your own time. We know it's a lot of information. We know it's coming all at once, but um, I I just want to remind us that um, the opportunity is so amazing. So many good things are happening and the support is there. So on that note, I do want to see if anybody has, if you could raise your hand, um, if you have a question. And I want to double down on the fact real quick that we'll be sending this PowerPoint out. So all these links that were in here, you didn't have to write them down. The PowerPoint will go out to you. So you'll be able to link through that. You'll also have the contact information for VSEL. If you have more legal questions, you can certainly email um, the email address there, or you can click through if you want to schedule a consultation. Um, that URL that's there leads you directly to the form to schedule the consult. Questions? I think someone named Ruth Brisson has a question in the chat. She says, does that process separate the two entities um, in response to the 501c3? So let's see, what is involved or how difficult is it to change from a DBA nonprofit to a 501c3 nonprofit? Um, technically, to be a nonprofit, you have to have established the IRS status of the nonprofit. And that's really what makes you a nonprofit is the federal tax status. You also have to establish state tax status. I don't know if you've done one or the other or both, or are you just calling yourself a nonprofit? It's going to depend on the circumstance. It shouldn't separate the entities. You'd have to roll them over and move the assets from one into the other. Um, think of it like buckets. You wanna make sure you transfer the whole bucket from one place to the other. Um, and a lawyer and an accountant can help you do that without splintering it into two different, different entities. I saw uh, one question was, um, uh, will these uh, sessions that I just talked about be sent out via email? They are all sent out through the Let's Grow Kids email. Last week, there was one that went out from Lorraine Burnett with a bunch of professional development opportunities. So you can see them that way um, on social media through Let's Grow Kids. Any other questions? All right, well, we certainly won't keep us all on longer. I This was so much information and there were some nuggets that, that I've written down that um, uh, uh, are really helpful. I hope you all got something out of this. Um, reach out to Aaron at First Children's Finance or me at Let's Grow Kids um, for and any follow-up questions. Go ahead, Jean. And, and quickly, I wanna thank my students who did an awesome job 
at this presentation. So thank you, Jasmine and Majabine and Callum for all your hard work putting this together and for rolling with the changes that came through. Um, so we really, we really appreciate your hard work and effort on this and, and your, your uh, becoming wonderful attorneys. So thank you. This, uh, Anne, this is not one that um, is through VFIS. I do not think I can check on that for you. I have all your information if it is, and um, we will get the information to VFIS if it is one that um, counts. Um, uh, I'm not sure about that. And um, I apologize for the technical difficulties. That was on me. I so appreciate the partnership with First Children's Finance, the Small Business Development Center, Jean and her students from um, Vermont Law School. So thank you all very much. Thank you all for the work that you do every day and every evening. And um, take care, everyone. Have a good evening. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Luann. Good night. Thank you.